Hi, good evening. This is um, Gemma here. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to share a few things with you tonight um, on prophecy. Um, I usually don't give my messages labels or, or, or titles or anything like that, but because I suspect deeply that this is going to be a series of messages, and as far as I can tell, the Lord wants me to do this on an almost daily basis, if not on a daily basis. Um, it's been called a panorama of prophecy. Um, that was the, the title the Lord dropped in my heart. I'm not one for big words, but um, that's the title, a panorama of prophecy. And in this series of messages, and I don't know how many there are going to be, I intend to just lay, paint a picture of prophecy from the book of Genesis down to the book of Revelation. In fact, when you think about prophecy, usually people think in the context of the things that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Some people go further and look at the things spoken of in Matthew chapter 24. People would look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. People look at 2 Thessalonians, especially when it talks about the man of sin with regard to 2 Thessalonians or the rapture with regard to 1 Thessalonians. But people forget that the Bible is a book of prophecy. In fact, the Bible is 66 books written by um, somewhere, somewhere in the region of about 40 different authors over the space of about 2,000 years or thereabouts. And it's all about prophecy. Starting with, the book of, uh, starting with the book of Genesis and then culminating in the book of Revelation. And the interesting thing is, the book of Revelation doesn't even tell you everything. The book of Genesis doesn't tell you everything. Zechariah tells you some, Daniel tells you some, Isaiah tells you some, Amos tells you some. Um, we see some prophecy in different books, directly and indirectly, overtly and covertly. Prophecy is literally littered all over the Bible. And so that's where I want to start from. Well, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk. I want to paint a picture about prophecy because I think it's on, on, it's important that we understand the whole um, counsel of God, and we speak from from the context of the whole counsel of God, rather than running off on tangents and picking one small thing in one small book and running away with it. That we understand the whole thing, and then on the basis of that, draw their proper conclusions. The, the Bible talks about, um, in fact, I'll, 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 I'll read it to you. It's in the book of Isaiah chapter 28. Um, for some reason, I went and opened Isaiah 29 by accident. I'll read to you Isaiah 28 in verse, from verse uh, 9. It says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Verse 11 says, For with stammering lips and other tongue will he speak to these people, to whom he said, This is a rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is a refreshing that yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And this card gives a paints a picture of how the word of God is given to us in the Bible. It's not given to us as one specific whole message. It's given to us almost literally broken in bits, scattered around different Bibles. It gives the impression of a design beyond the scope of the individual intelligence, intellect, ability, memory of the 40 plus individuals who wrote different portions of the Bible. And, and, and one of the reasons why I mentioned this, apart from the desire for you to understand prophecy as a whole, is also this idea that this book or this book of the Bible, the, the, the Word of God, which has been assembled together, is not the work of men, but the work of God himself. The Bible says in, um, in Proverbs 25, from verse 1, it says, These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But the honor of kings is to search out the matter. To search out a matter. What does the Bible tell us about us? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, called to show forth the excellencies of him 
who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Or, or, or to show forth the excellences of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Bible tells us that you and I are kings and priests. And the Bible also tells us that you and I have been called out of darkness into this marvelous light to show forth his excellency. Now, if the Bible is saying Proverbs 25 verse 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the honor of kings is to search out the matter, that means it is our responsibility. You and I, it doesn't matter our position in the church. It doesn't matter when you got born again. It doesn't matter if you have been in the kingdom for 20 years or for 20 minutes. Every one of us has a responsibility to search out the scriptures for themselves and for the sake of others. In um, in in First Timothy chapter four in verse fifteen, it says, "Let no one despise you." It says it, that's sorry, that's verse twelve. In verse fifteen, it says, "Meditate on these things. Give yourself wholly unto them. Give yourself wholly unto them, that those that that you may save yourself and them that hear you." That, that that word there, that that um, that command, that word of exhortation is not just to pastors, it's not just to bishops. Okay, he was speaking to a bishop at the time, but it's not just for pastors and bishops. It's for you and I. It's for you and I. Why? Because God wants us to understand these things as individuals. If you think about a certain young man called Steve or Stephen, in Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7, when you have some time, read the story. You'll see how Stephen was appointed as effectively an usher in the church. But here's something interesting. The Bible says Stephen did great miracles among the people. In other words, it wasn't because he was a pastor he did great miracles. He did great miracles despite only having the position of an usher in the church. Why? Because God intended for us to fully participate in this thing. But that's not even where I'm going to. Look at how Stephen defended the gospel. Stephen from the Old Testament proved that Jesus was the Christ prior to being stoned to death. And he was an usher. In many people's eyes, an usher is probably just an ordinary guy. This guy spoke eloquently defending the gospel, proving from the Old Testament that Jesus was the Christ. In other words, it did not matter what his position was. This guy had a vital relationship with the word of God. Now, I want you to just consider something. Um, there's a famous man, he's, um, he's gone to heaven now, but he said something very, very, very powerful about information. He studied information science. He went to the US Naval Academy. Um, he was in, in the military for a bit of a while, and then he became a defense contractor before he became, um, quote unquote, a full-time preacher and teacher. Um, his name, just in case you were wondering, is Chuck Misler. And he said something um, quite important some years ago, and I just found it. I've, I've been looking for it, and I just found it. It's on the subject of informational properties, and I'll read it to you. Because it says it far more eloquently than I could ever do myself. Um, sorry, um, I just lost my earpiece there. I'll just put it back. Um, he says, the hologram, so on informational properties, the hologram exhibits some very profound properties beyond the three-dimensional image. In fact, it is one of the most profound means to distribute information throughout a given media. All of the information it contains is distributed over the entire Im image surface. One can remove a portion of the hologram without losing the image, drill a hole in the hologram, and one can still view the entire object by simply moving one's eyes, one's eye to a more convenient angle. Some resolution or sharpness will be lost, however. Cut the film into pieces, and each piece con contains the complete image. An engineer who is designing a communication system in anticipation of hostile jamming or other countermeasures, and this is where I'm really going to tonight. It says, in a, a, an engineer who is designing a communication system in anticipation of hostile jamming or other countermeasures needs to employ several critical techniques to be effective. In addition to, make it, to taking advantage of available error detection and correction techniques, he will also attempt to spread his message throughout the available bandwidth. He will avoid clustering his message into areas which would increase his vulnerability into jamming or interference. And I'll continue with Chuck's words. So these words are not mine, this is Chuck Misler's words. It is provocative to notice that the, bi that the biblical text evidences these same techniques. Where is the chapter on baptism? or salvation, 
or any specific critical doctrine. Every major theme is spread throughout the 66 books, making up the total message. There is no concentration of any critical element in any single location. One can tear out a surprising number of pages and still not lose visibility of the essential message. Some resolution or clarity would be lost, however. This design, intent of distributing the vital elements throughout the entire message system, is even highlighted by Isaiah in the scripture that we quoted earlier, which is, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, and there a little. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. I'll stop there just now. This is just a brief introduction to this. I'll do another one, but this time looking at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Um, as far as I can tell, I'm going to keep to this one. I know I'm, I'm rather inconsistent with putting messages out there. But um, on the one hand, I don't like talking just for the sake of talking. And in addition, life does get very busy, unfortunately. Um, so God bless you, and I'll speak to you soon. God bless you. Bye.